Mounting tensions, deteriorating trust, alignment with the enemy, and a valuable championship belt at the very epicenter. These elements have all come together many times before to formulate compelling in-ring drama, but in this instance, this story goes far beyond the squared circle. Close to three decades ago, a falling out between a wrestling promotion's most dependable headliner and its designated shock caller opened the floodgates for an almost unthinkable scenario to play out. Journey with us now back to the year 1991, when in a monumental PR disaster, WCW cast out its world heavyweight champion, the nature boy Ric Flair, while he was in physical possession of the belt itself. I'm Jack from Cultaholic.com, and this is remembering Ric Flair taking the WCW championship to WWF. To any wrestling fan, Ric Flair is a man who needs no introduction. Lauded as one of the all-time most recognized and decorated champions of the ring, the Nature Boy was 42 years old at the time of this story and an 18-year pro. For over eight of the preceding 10 years, Flair held the NWA and or WCW World Heavyweight Championship, ceding it for an occasional stretch to rivals such as Harley Race, Dusty Rhodes, Sting, and a few others. At the forefront of the pro wrestling presented by Jim Crockett Jr. and Ted Turner, the colorful and charismatic Flair led the charge. The bad guy that you love to hate, even though you just couldn't take your eyes off him. Flair's name will forever be synonymous with professional wrestling. The name Jim Hurd, however, doesn't quite inspire the same sense of awe. A former manager at a St. Louis television station and later a regional manager for Pizza Hut, Hurd was hired as WCW's executive vice president in January 1989. This was mainly due to his connections and friendship with Ted Turner executive Jack Petrick. Hurd had no prior experience in the world of wrestling, except that in St. Louis, Hurd's TV station had aired wrestling programs before. Under Hurd, a booking committee was formed in WCW that included, at various stages, Flair himself, Dusty Rhodes, Jim Cornette, Kevin Sullivan, Ole Anderson, and others, to account for his lack of general product knowledge. Although Hurd did have plenty of assistance to make up for his dearth of wrestling instincts, the promotion still ran through him. Hurd has been charged with being the driving creative force behind a number of dud gimmicks. These include the inane Ding Dongs tag team, the hapless Desperados, smiling woodsman Big Josh, and the never produced hunchbacks tag team that you could never pin because they were hunchback, they had rounded spines. Do you see what he's done there? While filling the wrestling sewer with log after log of WrestleCraft did seem to be Heard's speciality, alienating valuable performers appeared to be another one of his specialities. The Road Warriors, Stan Hansen, Sid Vicious, and Jim Cornette are just a few of the Hall of Fame caliber stars that Heard's presence drove away from the promotion in the early 90s, and it wouldn't take too much longer for Ric Flair to follow suit. Two weeks into 1991, Flair defeated Sting in East Rutherford. New Jersey to become WCW World Heavyweight Champion, the first champion of the separate WCW title lineage. But he did still carry the familiar looking big gold belt of the NWA. Despite the title switch back to the near eternal champion, heavy conflict existed between Flair and Hurd. In the spring of 1990, Flair resigned from the booking committee due to Hurd's aggressive meddling. In that same time period, Flair refused to drop the world title to Lex Luger one night unless he received a contractual release, which Hurd refused to grant. Even after putting over Sting at a title match at the Great American Bash later that year, Heard declined to release Flair at his request. Because instead, Jim Heard had other ideas for his top ring general. Despite putting the top belt back around Flair's waist at the dawn of 91, Heard wanted to update the Nature Boy's in ring persona. In fact, believing that this Nature Boy character had gone long in the tooth, Heard proposed that Flair cut his hair short and change his gimmick to that of a Roman gladiator called Spartacus. No, I'm not making this up. Though he did trim his blonde mane, Flair put his foot down regarding any other modifications to his look and, crucially, had the backing of his friends on the booking committee. But Heard felt that for the 42-year-old Flair, the sun was setting, and he was looking at phasing him down in favor of Sting, Luger, and other younger stars. With the impending downgrade came a heated exchange over contract negotiations. WCW had lost over $6 million in 1990, so some belt tightening was understandably in order. And with Flair being pushed down the card per Heard's mandate, the champ was asked to agree to a pay cut of roughly half his annual salary, going from approximately 700 grand down to about 350 grand. 
Flair was still the champion and was scheduled to lose the title to Luger at the 1991 Great American Bash in Baltimore. In the weeks before the event, however, Flair and Heard could still not agree to the terms of the extended contract, with Flair refusing the pay cut and Heard holding his position. Monday, July the 1st, 1991 proved to be a crucial and surreal day in the history of pro wrestling. Over the week previous, an amended plan was put together in which Flair would lose the WCW world title to Barry Windham at a TV taping that night in Georgia. Windham would then go into the bash as champion and transition the belt onto Luger while Flair continued his tense negotiations with Heard. But somewhere along the way, despite Flair's willingness to put over his former horseman ally in a title match, plans changed, and Flair never did make it to the tapings that night. Before Flair could leave for the venue to do the honours for Barry Windham, Heard faxed a letter to Dennis Guthrie, Flair's attorney, informing him that they were terminating Flair's contract with 30 days notice, making him a free agent after August the 1st. WCW was no longer going to book the Nature Boy, not even at that night's tape for the understandably very crucial Barry Windham title match. The media picked up on this story and Flair openly maintained that he was in the right to refuse such a drastic pay cut. Two nights later, at a live event in East Rutherford, ring announcer Gary Michael Capetta informed the assembled crowd of 6,000 that Flair had been stripped of the title by Heard. And, as you might imagine, the fans erupted with outrage and shock. But wrestlers come and wrestlers go, even wrestlers with the caliber of a Ric Flair, for whatever reason, may manifest. To lose a wrestler can be quite common, but to lose a champion championship belt in the process, that's a little bit out of the ordinary. As per the regulations of the NWA, a champion had to put down a $25,000 deposit that would be returned to him upon his dropping of the belt, to prevent any shenanigans on said champion's part while he possessed the title. Flair, throughout his numerous title reigns, never actually collected his deposit, since he'd just be regaining the title anyway at some point down the line, so why bother? But in July 91, however, the trouble really started when Flair, while figuratively being shown the door, demanded his money from Heard, and Heard refused to pony up. Flair felt that the championship belt, per his deposit that had never been redeemed, was his property until somebody got off their ass and made things right. According to Flair, with interest factored in as well, he believed he was owed a total of $38,000 from his soon-to-be former employer. Heard postured to such a degree, unwilling to back down from his chosen stance, that he flat out refused to give Flair his deposit back. Believing Heard wasn't going to be reasoned with, Flair opened a lifeline with WWE, and before long, the belt was being shipped to Stanford, Connecticut, where it looked for all the world like Vince McMahon was going to win the ultimate game of capture the flag. Flair himself wasn't permitted to deal with outside contractual matters until after September 1st, but his situation in WCW was in tatters, so it was all but inevitable that he'd be headed north in two months. One week after Flair was informed of his termination, WCW attempted to fix the situation by offering him a one-year deal worth 750 grand. According to the Wrestling Observer, the desperation of the offer was encouraged by the TBS legal department, since Flair's firing had no real merit. This is because, of course, he was only really guilty of refusing to take a substantial pay cut. The Great American Bash, with Flair originally scheduled to headline, sat only days away, and the company had egg on its collective face. When the Bash hit Baltimore on Sunday, July 14th, the crowd of over 9,000 chanted for a star not even on the card. At different points through the night, audible refrains of We Want Flair echoed through the Baltimore arena. And the the slightly reconfigured card did little to take their attention away from the absent icon. When Luger defeated Windham in a steel cage match for the held up title, he was awarded a somewhat generic belt from the territories, which now had a tacky looking WCW World Heavyweight Champion nameplate attached to the front. Luger Windham was probably the best match of an infamously wretched show, but as Flair's shadow loomed, nobody was going to remember that bout for anything positive. Amid WCW's ongoing nightmare, the ultimate dream match nudged closer to becoming a reality, Ric Flair versus Hulk Hogan. Wrestling magazines for years had speculated on what would happen should the kingpin of the Crockett territory match up against McMahon's well-paid muscle man. In 1991, there was really only one other logical place Ric Flair could go to make the sort of money that his name and prestige commanded, and seeing as he'd already sent feelers and the actual belt to New York, a jump to WWE was all but inevitable. All that was left to do was ride out the clock. At the very end of July, WCW made one last-ditch effort to re-sign Flair. He met with both Heard and Jack Petrick, but Flair bought at whatever offer was made to him. Days later, Vince McMahon commissioned major amendments to episodes of WWE Superstars and the Wrestling Challenge that aired two weeks before SummerSlam. On both shows, Bobby Heenan cut similar promos, one alone and one in the company of Gorilla Monsoon and Jim Neidhart, where he brandished the belt, saying that comparing the belts and the men who possessed them would be like comparing ice cream to horse manure. If that weren't even astonishing enough, Heenan boldly dropped the name Ric Flair as his punctuation, indicating that the 
bigger star outside of WWE was on his way. He then continued to brandish the belt on WWE television, attesting to Flair's greatness while repeatedly putting Hogan and every other superstar on notice. In effect, WWE, through Heenan, demonstrated that Flair was to be treated like a living god, as opposed to the also-ran that Jim Hurd had viewed him as. In the first week of September 1991, Flair officially signed his deal with WWE and filmed his first appearance for the coming Monday's edition of Primetime Wrestling. There, Heenan ordered a red carpet be rolled out before giving Flair a stirring introduction fit for a king. In his debut speech, Flair affirmed his self-proclaimed real-world champion status before making pointed remarks to Hogan as well as Rowdy Roddy Piper. The belt's continued presence on WWE programming remained a public relations nightmare for a badly ailing WCW. A new championship belt was commissioned for Luger in late July, but that wasn't going to stop Flair and Heenan from displaying the genuine gold on WWE TV. Shortly after Heenan first held the belt for WWE's TV cameras, a cease and desist was filed against the company, which WWE initially ignored because technically Flair claimed ownership over the whole deposit thing. But WCW felt they owned the belt, listing it as an asset acquired by Ted Turner in his purchase of the company in 1988. Flair maintained his offer to sell it back for a price of around $50,000, accounting for his deposit, accrued interest, and appreciation of the belt's value over the years. Having had their fun for a while, WWE ultimately complied with the cease and desist, even going so far as to agree to digitally blur the belt out of the already taped syndicated shows, which was explained in kayfabe as a ruling by President Jack Tunney since the belt wasn't realized by WWE. Flair, still needing an outsider belt to bolster his real-world champion boasts, began toting around a modified WWE World Tag Team title instead. Here, the TV blurring actually benefited WWE because it hid the fact that the belt wasn't actually the one used by WCW and the NWA. But ringside photos have since surfaced over the years, including from the 91 Survivor Series, revealing the altered design. Eventually, Flair was paid his money back with interest and the belt was returned to the National Wrestling Alliance. Upon winning the Royal Rumble match in 92 that netted him the WWE Championship, a lively and jubilant Flair stated to the TV audience that the title was the only title in the wrestling world that makes you number one. Days before the Rumble, Jim Hurd resigned from WCW, in part due to ongoing struggles with Booker Dusty Rhodes and his unwillingness to move to a non-wrestling department in Turner's company. His three-year tenure as WCW Executive Vice President is largely considered to be a bust, with his handling of the Flair situation often referenced. The entire ordeal wasn't the last time championships were used as weapons in the WWE versus WCW war. Medusa's trashing of the women's title on an episode of Nitro in 95 was a vigorous smack across her ex-employer's face. And when champion Bret Hart was leaving for WCW in 97, a paranoid Vince McMahon, not wanting Eric Bischoff to announce that he'd signed away the champ, got the belt off of Bret rather infamously. Maybe you've heard of it. Flair wasn't even the last unbeaten WCW champion to leave the company for New York. Chris Benoit followed suit in 2000, but he simply handed the belt back before exiting. But the saga between Ric Flair, Jim Hurd, WCW, and WWE remains one of the strangest and most fantastical episodes of promotional warfare that there has ever been. Thanks very much for watching and let us know what you think in the comments section down below. You can follow Cultaholic on Twitter at Cultaholic and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do, then please do check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic, where you can pledge. And don't forget, of course, most importantly of all, to hit subscribe and to join us.